eighty percent of the times there are some findings in X-ray in pulmonary embolism. So, but those findings are very non-specific. So, like there is, there'll be some pleural effusion, there'll be some pulmonary infiltrates, there'll be some elevation of the hemidiaphragm, there'll be some atelectasis. These are very non-specific. All the patients uh, in ICU will have some atelectasis because of immobility, because of ventilator support, because of multiple factors, surgery and all. The, most of the patients will have some polycerositis and will have some pleural effusion. The pulmonary infiltrates in AP view is difficult to diagnose. So, so the patients will have these findings on X-ray. But there are some typical signs, classic signs, which have been mentioned, which I'll I'll tell you more because of the, this is academically important, but clinically, these signs are rarely seen. It is seen in only 15 to 20% of the cases. But if they are seen, then we should be highly suspicious of it, if the, that the patient is having pulmonary embolism. The first of that sign is Westermark sign. So what is Westermark sign? It is a regional oligemia. So what happens is there is, there is decrease in vascularity distal to the occlusion. So there is there will be a pulmonary embolus. The pulmonary embolus will occlude the vessel. So distal to that occlusion, there will be no flow. So what will happen is the X-ray will show decrease in pulmonary vasculature distal to that embolus. So <clears throat> that part is called, that point is called Westermark sign. So what is Hampton's hump? This is, a, this is the other most uh, uh, frequently asked question in the Viva. So what is Hampton's hump? Hampton's hump is a pulmonary infarct. So what happens is the distal pulmonary artery, the ambulance goes to a distal pulmonary artery, it blocks the supply to that part of the lung and that part of the lung goes, gets infected. So what will happen? That, that will show in the area as that, that area will be looking like a consolidation. So the third common sign is Fleshner sign. It is an enlarged pulmonary artery. What is Palas sign? Chang sign. So let us see the x-rays of these signs. So this is Western mark sign. As pointer is pointing out, there is hyperemia in the perihilar region, but immediately after there is polygemia. So this is Western mark sign because the embolus is stuck and it is not allowing the blood to go distal to that. So this is Hampton's hump. You can see small distal infarcts. The middle uh, picture is showing a CT scan. The other, the, the uh, side two pictures are showing uh, X-ray. In these X-rays, you can see there is a, there is a wedge-shaped opacity. So this is called Hampton's hump. This is all. This is also very classic of pulmonary embolism. So you can see this is not looking like any consolidation. This is more looking like a rounded opacity that a regional a particular part of the lung has not uh, uh, getting uh, any perfusion. So this is Fleshner sign. Fleshner sign is you can see there is an enlarged pulmonary artery, main pulmonary artery. In the Pala sign, the right descending pulmonary artery is enlarged. So these are the signs which are uh, less frequently seen. So we cannot diagnose with the uh, clinical signs and symptoms. We cannot diagnose with the X-ray. Now coming to ECG. So ECG also, many people say it will be S1, Q3, T3. So let me tell you, S1, Q3, T3 is a classical sign. It is not very sensitive. It is not very specific even. So the S1, Q3, T3 sign, if you get, then you can think that this patient may have pulmonary embolism, but it is not specific. It has a high positive predictive value, but it is not specific. Okay. Then second thing is RV stain because the RV has dilated. RV, there is RV dysfunction. There will be the TVLs will be inverted in V1 to V4. So inferior leads and the inferior leads also, the TVLs will get inverted. The, the most common sign as described by Many people is sinus tachycardia, but it is also present in only 20 to 30 percent of the patients. So sinus tachycardia, absence of sinus tachycardia is not a criteria to rule out pulmonary embolism. This is also very important. The fourth sign is complete or incomplete right bundle branch block. As you can see in the, C, in the uh, ECG, which is shown in the picture, there is right bundle branch block and pattern in V1, V2, V3, V4. So th these are the these are the ECG changes which can get you suspicious about patient having pulmonary embolism. But this is, these are not specific or sensitive for pulmonary embolism. You should not look for this. You should not rule out pulmonary embolism based on these signs. Uh, the <clears throat> fourth thing is D-dimer. This is very commonly sent. All the, all the medical professionals, they, what they do is, uh, the patient is having high chances of pulmonary embolism, let us send, send, send D-dimer. So D-dimer has its place. 
but d dimer in hospitalized patients in patients having cancer in patients having severe infection inflammation pregnancy the the d dimers will be elevated because what is d dimer it is basically a fibrin associated product so whenever there will be thrombosis and when whenever there will be fibrinolysis d dimer will get uh, elevated so d dimer is not specific or sensitive it is only having a good negative predictive value so the d dimer is negative you can say that 95% of the case times the patient will not be having a major pulmonary embolus that's it so getting a positive d dimer report in itself is not a indication to get a ct angiography done okay let me be very clear about it ct angio should not be done only on the basis of positive d dimer report 90% of the patients in intensive care unit if you send d dimer level it will be high but don't chase that d dimer level okay so how d dimer is used d dimer is used in emergency department so we do, we calculate a clinical probability score we calculate a clinical probability score based on many factors which we will be discussing in next slides after calculating clinical probability score we corroborate that clinical probability score with d dimer levels to see if we need to get a ctpa for the patient or not it is not done in icu or hospitalized patient should not be routinely done okay then now the trend has come initially the d dimer level was fixed for around 500 so people were saying that it is very sensitive then the level was changed in one study to 1000 uh, uh, <clears throat> pygogram per liter but again that uh, d dimer level was not uh, giving us many things so so what they did was they they checked the age age adjusted d dimer cutoffs for patients more than 50 years so 10 mg per liter for every Uh, for patient more than 50 years so if the patient is 60 years it will be 600 the cutoff will be 600 patient of 70 years the cutoff will be 700 so this is how they did it and this they saw that the 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 the, 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 the predictive value the negative predictive value and the positive predictive value along with using clinical probability scores it has enhanced so uh, there is some evidence in the guidelines of the american uh, society of cardiology also say that we should use age adjusted levels of d dimer okay and d dimer should be a quantitative elisa level we should send we should not use a semi quantitative level because that is not that sensitive okay so how to uh, check the pre test probability so pre test probability is the test means either to go for a ct angiogram or to go go for a vq vq scan before that test what is the probability that patient is having that pulmonary embolism probability of a patient having pulmonary embolism so place patients are classified into having high probability intermediate probability and low probability based on the probability score as well as the d dimer level so how to do it so, so how they do it they they have defined a, because see clinical if i say that the patient is having high probability of pulmonary embolism and my colleague says that the patient is having low probability of pulmonary embolism so it is a subjective criteria so what they did was they formed a prediction rules so how they formulated prediction rules they combined symptoms clinical findings and risk factors the predisposing factors for the patient and based on that they devised a score if the score is above a particular value they say that the patient is having high chances of uh, pulmonary embolism and we should go for ct pulmonary angiogram or other uh, invasive test to be eco or other uh, invasive test so even after a patient is ruled uh, having a low after defined as a low probability of uh, pulmonary embolism even after that 10% of those patients will have pulmonary embolism okay so we should be aware we should be highly suspicious but at the same time we should not be doing ct pulmonary angio and d dimers at for all the patients so this is a pulmonary embolism rule out criteria which is uh, being shown in this slide so if the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria is zero then uh, the, then with the uh, and the patient is having pre pre test and the other uh, the and the clinician also thinks that the patient is having low probability of pulmonary embolism and the uh, uh, prediction rules also say that the patient is having low pulmonary uh, probability of pulmonary embolism then probably we don't need to go for d dimer and the test okay so what are the prediction rules the most validated is revised geneva clinical prediction rule 
so it was early uh, it it is it has a original version as a simplified version it incorporates history of uh, dvt heart rate uh, history of surgery hemopsis cancer and urinate unilateral lower limb pain pain in the lower limb with dvt uh, on d venous palpation and uh, age more than 65 years so in the original version they have divided it into uh, low intermediate and high if the score is less than 3 or less than 3 then the clinical probability of having pulmonary embolism is low if the score is more than 10 then the probability is high in the simplified version where they have actually reduced the points for everything to into one and except the heart rate more than 95 which they have given two points for that if the uh, the score is 0 to 1 then the probability is low and if the score is more more equal more than equal to 5 then the probability is high so how to use these probabilities i'll come to that also so this is similarly wells clinical prediction rule for pulmonary embolism it is also a similar score both the scores can be used but uh, american uh, the european society of cardiology recommends us to use a uh, modified geneva score uh similarly a years criteria has been formed to simplify the scores if you cannot remember the scores in day to day practice what they have done is that if the patient you are suspecting a patient is of, of having a pulmonary embolism they ask us to see three things one is hemopsis the patient has had hemopsis if the pulmonary embolism is the most likely diagnosis and the patient has clinical signs of dvt deep venous thrombosis there is leg swelling there is pain in the legs there is pain on deep in deep palpation of the uh, thigh then is either of these uh, uh, these things are present the patient is having hemopsis or embolism or is the pulmonary embolism most likely diagnosis as per your clinical evaluation and the patient is having sign of dvt and if there is one item present any one of this is present and d dimer is is more than 1000 then you should go for a ctp and if any one item is present and d dimer is more than 500 even then you go for ctp but if the d dimer is less than 5 even in presence of any one of these items you should not go for ctpa pulmonary embolism has been excluded with reasonable probability and if the d dimer is more than 1000 and there is no item of is present even then you can order for ctpa this is controversial also but still you can go for ctpa in a patient who has presented to emergency not in opd or not in a hospitalized patient okay and if there is if the dimer is less than 1000 and no none of these three clinical uh, these items are present then the pulmonary embolism is again excluded similarly uh, this was a study which was done by uh, unathan feud et al and this this was the pulmonary embolism rule out criteria doesn't uh, rule out pulmonary embolism but the clinical probability of pulmonary embolism is low then if you uh, combine years rule the years rule which we have seen with d dimer then the <coughs> chances of missing out on pulmonary embolism is less than the controls so again uh, years algorithm can also be used uh, <coughs> so this is how we move so once we see that the patient is having as per the clinic clinician the patient is having pulmonary embolism in emergency a department or the patient is in opd uh, <coughs> and the and the patient is in the clinician thinks that the probability of pulmonary embolism is more than 50 per, 15% then the patient has to be tested on the level, lines of clinical probability score and d dimer assess if the clinician thinks that the pulmonary embolism is less than the chances of pulmonary embolism is less than 15% then he has to calculate perc score the pulmonary embolism rule out score so if the pulmonary embolism rule out score is more than 1 then you again have to test for uh, the clinical probability score that is well score revised geneva score or simplified geneva score along with the d dimer either age adjusted d dimer or manufacturer recommended or less than 1000 whatever you take it is better if you take age age adjusted cut off and then see if still the probability is high or low if the clinical probability is low after that then the pulmonary embolism is ruled out there is no need to go for Uh, ct angiogram in such patients and if the clinical probability is high then we need to go for ct angiogram and see if the ct pulmonary is the patient is having pulmonary embolism or not so either of these can be used you have to first use pers pers criteria 
PRC, if you see that the PRC is negative and clinical probability is low, as the clinician thinks the probability is low, no need to do anything. Pulmonary embolism is most likely ruled out. If the PERC is positive, then you have to calculate Wells, revised Neva, or simplify any one of these codes or use a year's algorithm along with DDIMS. So after checking this, again, if you think that the scores are high, then you have to go for CT pulmonary angiogram. So this was basically designed to avoid CT pulmonary angiogram, unnecessary CT pulmonary angiogram. So what is the role of compression ultrasound? Compression ultrasound, people say that doing a compression ultrasound uh, on a, in a patient suspected of having DVT will uh, embolize that thrombus. With a, although the clinical evidence is not uh, great in this, and no uh, guidelines recommend not to do it. In fact, guidelines say that if you suspect DVT, that you should do uh, compression ultrasound in such patients. And uh, the sensitivity of uh, uh, <clears throat> proximal DVT uh, for proximal DVT is around 90%. Although the compression ultrasound generally misses distal DVT. And uh, <clears throat> if the patient is having clinical suspicion of pulmonary embolism and there is a uh, DVT in uncompression ultrasound, obviously we have to start anticoagulation. But if it is other way around, the patient is having a uh, DVT and we need to see if the patient is having pulmonary embolism or not, we have to do risk assessment scores and if, if needed, uh, 2D eco and CT pulmonary angiogram. So compression ultrasound, where it, uh, the role of compression ultrasound comes, when the CT pulmonary ang angiogram is contraindicated, like severe renal failure, of the patient is having uh, uh, allergy to the contrast, or the patient is uh, pregnant female, it is not contraindicated, but can be avoided uh, in a patient in a pregnant female. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the CT pulmonary angiogram comes inconclusive, then you can corroborate your uh, uh, clinical finding with the compression ultrasound. So how, where we do the compression ultrasound, it is basically uh, three points. One is common femoral vein. Then we move the probe down one to 1.5 centimeters. Look at the great septus vein and superficial femoral vein. Then we come to the popliteal fossa, popliteal fossa and the popliteal vein trifurcation. So what we do is we see if the uh, deep veins are getting compressed or not. So one is non-compressibility. The most, uh, the second thing is if we can see the visible clot and if there is an augmentation with color doctor. So these are the findings which we get, uh, which are positive for uh, uh, this uh, deep venous thrombosis. But there are some caveats. So if the patient is having superficial thrombophlebitis, Baker's cyst, lymph nodes, pseudoaneurysms, and groin hematoma. So it can be confused with DBT. So we should be aware of this.